Welcome to the 1974 podcast. This week we are joined by current members Adam Clymer, Mike Forgette, John Dotson, Nick Dickinson, and Nicole Dickinson, along with former members Tim Moore and Angela Doherty, to discuss 1974 and the death of the Herald. This is the continuation of the Laser Trilogy. I'm Adam Clymer, and this is the 1974 podcast. We are joined today by uh, Mike Forget. Say hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Uh, we are joined by Nick and Nicole Dickinson. Say hi, Nick and Nicole Dickinson. Hi, hi Mike. <laughs> uh, we are joined by John Dotson. Say hi. Howdy. Super excited to have with us Tim Moore. Hey, Tim. How you doing there, McCready? <laughs> <laughs> doing all right. <laughs> doing all right. And we are also very thrilled to continually have back with us Angela Doherty. I prefer Galaxy Girl, but I'll take it. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. So, uh, last week, uh, in our first podcast, we talked all about Laser Force and what it was and how it came to be, and uh, that was just so much fun. So, we wanted to continue on with uh, talking about uh, 1974 and the Death of the Herald, which was the next album in succession uh, to uh, 1974 and the Battle for the Laser Fortress. I'm just going to jump in. Where does the story begin here? What, where, how do we come from Laser Fortress into uh, Death of the Herald? What's the story? Where are we in this particular aspect of the Laser Trilogy story? We it's are a prequel to a prequel. Yeah, do it at the beginning! So wait, so let me get this straight. So Laser Fortress is not the start of the story. No. You know that. Adam, I don't think you could ever get this straight. <laughs> I'm acting as a moderator, my friend. Here. I'm pretending <laughs> I don't know anything. So, so tell me, Mike, where, what, what Laser Fortress is what? Beginning, middle, end? What's Laser Fortress? Laser Fortress is the end. And, and, and Harold and, goes back to start telling how we got to Laser Fortress. Is this correct? Yeah, so Harold and Echoes of War... Were are, are made up of all of the backstory we created while we were writing Laser Fortress because there's a certain number of the band that kept asking why things were in place and we needed to basically create a backstory that was lengthier than the story we were trying to tell in Laser Fortress. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> as a result, we had this gigantic backstory that we ended up, that's what we ended up doing with our next full-length albums was telling that. So we started from the beginning in Death of the Herald and then Echoes of War it bridges the gap between Death of the Herald and Laser Forge. Okay, so tune in next week. Uh, we'll have another podcast next week. Uh, we're going to talk about The Echoes of War, uh, which is the final album we recorded to finish up the Laser Trilogy. So I'm, gonna, I'm going straight into this. Uh, we open up 1974 and The Death of the Herald with The Great Galactic War. In my opinion, one of the best songs we ever did. Tell me, what is The Great Galactic War? Tim, Tim, what is The Great Galactic War? Oh, jeez, man. <laughs> um... Besides an album you still want to write. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Um, it's, you know, it's the culmination of terribleness. It just think, okay, put it this way. Think 200 years from now, and that's going to be the Great Galactic War. <laughs> I don't think it's even that far. I think it's maybe like 35. Okay, all right, fair. Like, I'll take that. Yeah. All right. So somewhere between 35 and 200 years from now, we will enter the Great Galactic War. That's 1,974 right. years from now. So it was something like it was, it was the year 19,740 or 10,974 at some it point. Was just, it was just the, the numbers were just switched around. Yeah, dude. exactly. <laughs> it, was, it was sometime in the future, and there was a 1,974 in there somewhere. Of um, course. The Great Galactic War, the story that was just, there was this gigantic, we needed, uh, so the reason that, the, the reason for the story of the Great Galactic War was we needed a reason why there was a laser fortress. So why are there satellites in space that form a grid around the Earth? Like, what caused that? And basically, we just created this gigantic, like, intergalactic war, like planets that were just fighting and fighting and fighting, and then that was the answer, the Earth's answer is just to set up this gigantic grid that kept out everybody. Um, from invading the planet, and that's what the uh, that's what the song's actually about. It's like the devastation and the creation of the grid, and then when the treaty was finally reached, the grid was deactivated. Okay, so one of my favorite parts of this is uh, uh, there's an awesome synth part played by Angela on the album, but I think you, Mike, you wrote that part, correct? I think I wrote the, yeah, I wrote the song um, when I was in California with an acoustic guitar, and then we just brought it back and we kind of like 
figured out what was in I think I remember hearing that there was two feet for an album called the laser fortress. There was like no synth in that album. And how dare you write an album about the laser fortress with no synth. So that was like first track. We decided, okay, we're throwing a synth right there. <laughs> well, can we, can we be fair? I did not own a synth, so it never got on the album. And then all of a sudden, like Harold comes along and I don't have to worry about keyboards anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and I got three. <laughs> so yeah, did that that opening was done on the uh, the mic record, right? Yeah, all of a sudden, was like on a the baby yeah, that yeah, was on top of my other keyboard. Yeah, yeah exactly. It was perfect. Um, so I think that's one of the one of the best openings to any album. I just what a, what a great way to kick off an album. I, I want to jump into the next song because this one of the, this is one of my favorites personally. That goes into Phantoms, and much like we were talking about with Laser Fortress, mm-hmm. it literally goes from like this crazy over the top epic, oh, yeah. almost like almost like a folk song in my opinion, but I think what really stands out in Phantoms is Angela, Tim, and Mike's voice. I think the harmonies throughout this song are just unbelievably beautiful, and really, I have to give credit to Angela, Mike, and Tim for that. Yeah. So, Mike, again, I think this was pretty much penned top to bottom by you, correct? Yeah, and it had different lyrics at first, and it, under I was just really not happy with it. it. I think we went right up until we we recorded our little like I don't know what do you call like the things that we did. We basically recorded the album before we recorded the album. We just demoed it, really. Yeah, yeah, three yeah. albums. <laughs> yeah, right before, the, right before the demo of the album was recorded, like I kept changing it and changing it. It was mostly lyrics. The sunroom demos, if you will. Yeah, the sun, they were sunroom demos. Yeah. And actually, if you go back onto our YouTube channel and scroll through the videos, you can see a lot of us doing the demos for Death of the Herald. Well, we have a, I think we have a video for Essential Arms on there that's the demo what? of Essential Arms. It's a demo version of Essential Arms. That, yeah. 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 So if you go back on the, if you go back on our, you know, when you're done listening to this, if you go back onto our YouTube channel, you can see a lot of the demo stuff we were doing. We did a lot of video for it. Actually, can I interject here? This was the first time we had videographers with us in the studio for almost the entire time. Yeah, correct? CP is so bad. Yeah, yeah so bad was CP there. So bad was there, yeah. So, so the change the change in um the change in style was just because, you know, the Great Galactic War was this gigantic, you know, the world like galactic, there's just so much happening. So like it's again this very intense it's a very short song actually, but this very intense, musically intense piece with dark, sinister undertones because, you know, the grid actually has a theme to it. So like in this album, the grid's theme is that sort of like slow breakdown in Great Galactic War that comes back again in Echoes of War when the grid gets turned back on by the by the clone army. But then Phantoms is just, it, it kind of, it's a little bit like Temps in that it's the aftermath of something intense happening. Like in Laser, it was Guider Hands happened, the moon blows up, all the people that were clones are now dead, and then Temps is a very slow song about what, what to do after that. This is kind of like that, but, you know, a different time era, a different era of time. You know, it happens way before. And it's not 99% of the population that's wiped out, so it's a little bit less intense. That takes us into Herald of Life, and Herald of Life was penned pretty much from the beginning by Angela, I believe. So there's a lot of cool, yes. cool work in Herald of Life. And again, not that I want to just fly through the first couple of songs, but, but I think what stands out on this particular song is again vocals this is this is angela sings most of this which is nice and there's a great moment in this where there's um two counter melodies happening one from angela and one from tim and i think you know phantoms and herald of life both have some of the best or more interesting to me i suppose vocal work in this entire album until we get a little bit later on in this album so angela when you were writing this what where did this come from? Um, I actually, like, before I had uh, joined the band, I had, like, played the piano at home a bit. And I had, like, a, a piano piano. I didn't have a keyboard. Um, and I had, like, this teeny tiny little book of sheet music where I had written down, like, chord progressions that I really liked or just, like, little, like, riffs, if you will, that I really liked. And I have this one uh, in that in that little tiny book, and I really wanted to, to use it in 1974, just because I thought it was so cool, and I was so proud of myself for coming up with something that didn't suck. So I presented it, and I remember the original way I presented it, like no nobody liked it. Like everybody was like cool with like the like the chords and the way they were progressing but they didn't like the actual way I was playing it. So we actually, instead of doing chords, that's when it turned into the 
dun, 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 dun. So instead of just playing chords, I was playing the chords one note at a time. And then the lyrics, this is what I was talking about um, last time we were all talking. Like, Gary taught me how to write a song. I wrote this song with Gary on the porch while I was, like, chain-smoking with cigarettes one day. And, um... <laughs> like you do. Uh, like you do. And, uh, yeah, I, I just, like, don't even... I don't even remember. It's just, like... It's because Grandpa Gary taught me. I don't know where the lyrics came from. I don't know why they're like that and I didn't even realize that we were going to use like two voices to make the song it, I, I didn't even originally imagine that it was like I I take credit for a lot of the song but there was so much editing done by everyone that like it really does feel like it was such a collaborative effort because otherwise I it wouldn't it wouldn't sound like this if not for everybody else kind of being like, well, what if we did it like this? Well, that's good, but like we need another voice doing this or that's too many words. What if we had two people singing at the same time? <laughs> so yeah, it was awesome. It was the first song I've ever written. So I didn't know this, but did you write all of the lyrics for it? And because Tim's part, the part that Tim sings, did, are those your lyrics? And did you write those? I wrote all of them, I think up until a point. No. I did. I think I did Within the Storm, and I did, yes. the, bridge, I did the bridge, Death Won't Stop Us. Yes, you definitely did. Yeah, I know I didn't write all of the lyrics, but I wrote, like, the meat of the lyrics. Gotcha. There's some great Tim vocal at the end of that, like, in the clouds and all these other things. There's some There's some pretty powerful <laughs> Tim voice in there. There's some, there's some big Tim voice in there. Yeah, yeah well, you made me go up at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you, had, you did that a lot. <laughs> I just I liked pushing you because man, when you when you got into it, you you could you could rip them, dude. Yeah, uh, well. But you so, came up with the melody for your part, though, right? Like the the flashes of resistance. What the, it was Angela's lyrics, but it was your melody, right? I think it might have been my melody, but I think it just kind of it just kind of happened. Like it was an easy thing to just kind of pull out because it, it just followed the base of the notes and mm -hmm. it followed the structure of the timing. So it just kind of it just kind of was like meant to be in there, sort of. What I liked about this one was. Not only the vocal, but that arpeggio that Angela plays, I had to do that on guitar. So there's two things doing that. There's a guitar part and there's a key, and we mixed them together. It was so great. It was like, oh, good, okay, we have this keyboard part, and here's the arpeggios, and they were, you know, nice, and then all of a sudden we put in the dun-dun-dun into, like, every other one of them, which would throw off the arpeggio. Oh, my God. I'll never forgive you for that. That wasn't me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. okay. Okay. It wasn't me. Angela didn't. Yeah, Angela wasn't the one who wanted the arpeggios, though. So, like, her, I think it originally was like, dun, 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 yes, dun, dun, yes, just, it was. Oh my, I can't believe you remember that. Yeah, and then it was like your vocals happened on a pause. It was dun, 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 dun. Yes, you remember everything. It's crazy. The next song up became kind of a live thing for us. We did this live a lot, although it was a strange song. Building an Empire follows uh, Harold life and building an empire was very similar in the sense to me personally of like the over but strange it had a lot of parts to it i remember very um, it, yeah real riffy and then the other thing that strikes me is we decided yeah <laughs> isaac young, we decided to call isaac young who showed up to the studio one day and just whipped out like this crazy saxophone which became the second part of the guitar solo. So my, my guitar solo is the end of the uh, song, and my guitar solo goes into his saxophone solo. Where did building it? I had nothing to writing of building an empire. Where did this come from? That was um, well. The story behind building an empire was so Herald of Life. We, we, we went over. So Herald of Life is the introduction of Aldous Brace, who's the character who creates the ability to you know uh, clone your m mind digitally, so you can download your consciousness. So, Building an Empire is a song about him creating the business to market that that thing, and it's an instrumental. It's not because it, we figured it wasn't something that needs to be. Oh no, there no, there's there's lyrics in it a little bit towards the middle. There's not a lot. Uh, you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. You're right. It's not an instrumental, but they're very brief. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it was only like that part of the. So okay, so the very beginning, I think, was my riff. The da 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 I think was Gary. He wrote that part. And then the verses, I think Gary wrote the music for it. The da 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 Actually, I think that's just a piece of his. That's just a piece of the the second part that he wrote. Just slow down a little bit, and then. 
the lyrics on top of that are, are basically like the doubt, like everything, like if you're trying to invest in things and you know, it's really tough at first. So like he's, he's putting everything into it. Like there's those second thoughts about, is this the right thing to do? Should I do this? Am I going to go bankrupt and all that sort of stuff? And there's all this like sort of negative swell behind. And the idea would be that it leads to the downfall of humanity. So yeah, this is a bad idea. But at the time, this guy just wants to, you know, make money and stuff like that. So he ends up doing it anyways. And as for Isaac Young solo, I remember very specifically, he came to the, he came to the, to the studio with a solo kind of already in mind, like with what he wanted to play. And he had we, we sent him the track, right? We had sent him like a rough version of the track. Yeah, right? he knew he knew what he was playing on top of. And I think he had time to practice something because he came to the he came to the he came to the studio and he played a lot of very similar things over and over again. He just really wasn't feeling any of it. And then he was like, "I'm going to go off book and I'm just going to do whatever I want to do." And that was the one take. I don't think he did one take after after that. Like he just nailed something. Like that entire solo was just completely improv on the spot. And that note that just held out at the beginning, that's just like five years long note that he, like, <laughs> you know, so like, he did that. And I remember everyone's kind of looking at each other in booth going, you don't have to go back in that room, Isaac. That was it. Well, that, that leads me to, uh, we didn't record this one like we recorded laser. We recorded this one in a studio. It actually cost us money. It was not all DIY. You know, we, we had little to do with it other than the production of it and, of course, the writing and performing of it. But Jeff Weed, who owns Sonic in Bloomfield, we went up there to do it, and I have a distinct memory of Isaac doing that solo, walking down into Jeff's little, you know, live room, doing his improv solo, and coming out of it, you know, coming back up to this, okay, guys, what do you want to do next? And I remember just being like, okay, we're done. <laughs> like this, okay, we got what we need. We're all done now. <laughs> so I distinctly remember that as well, but it was just, you know, he had some ideas. They were all good, but, you know, nothing moved anybody. And then he just whipped that soul out like it was nothing off the top of his head. And like five more minutes, he was in the car and gone. Cause we didn't, you can't top what he did. I also have a very distinct memory of him. <laughs> this is silly and stupid, but like, he came up to us. He was like, I want you guys to know. And he pulls out a reed. He's like, this reed sounds amazing. <laughs> and, I've, and I've been saving this for you guys. <laughs> it's like, yeah. cool, man. <laughs> Gar Gary was the only one in the band that like played any other, like he played horns. He, he still kind of plays saxophone. And Gary was like, cool. The rest of us were like, yeah, great. It's a piece of wood. Because, because Gary ended up playing saxophone for us on uh, Echoes uh, of War. Um, he also did it on Laser at the end of Song of Survival. Oh, that's right. That's right. But my gosh, how quickly I forget, right? So yeah, that, uh, building an empire became something we did live a lot. And actually, Isaac played with us live a handful of times. Yep. I think he oh played my God, Vision and Grit. Oh and my Grit. God. Yeah. I that was I down, you guys. They had to shut down. Yeah, they did. Yeah. So the next song, actually, I want to talk to some of the current members because everybody at this point knows this one. Uh, Essential Arms is one we... we still play it's still very much i don't think there's been a gig that we haven't played it um, cherry street. that's it <laughs> right because they would not it's, like it here. Oh, yeah, but, oh yeah we didn't do a cherry street because it's not it's not you know it's not a cherry street gig uh song but essential arms i remember when we wrote essential arms i had watched some sort of documentary they're talking about how queen does their vocals and how like each member of the band takes one part and then each member takes the second part and each member takes the third part to do the singing and that's how they got those huge queen vocals so you know it's you know layered seven eight nine times and it's you know Four, four voices nine times. I wanted to try that on this song and that's how we got the vocals of this particular song. And there's actually a great video on YouTube of us doing that. Um, but I remember specifically when you guys, well, 4 brought that in that riff and then we put the chords behind it. And then the only other thing I can remember distinctly was the sitar because it was just like, <laughs> yeah, because you yeah. just said, why not? Let's just do it. I was so mad at you. Did you first sitar? So mad for you don't remember. Oh my god, I fought you. I fought you so hard on that. On the sitar, I don't remember. Yeah, I fought you on the sitar, and I fought uh, about a lot of uh, keyboard noises I didn't like. <laughs> People would be like, "That sit sounds great," and I'd be like, "Fuck that! That sounds terrible. I'm not playing that." That sounds fucking stupid. And then someone would inevitably, Gary would have to like take me outside and be like, Angela, it sounds really good. You just calm down. And I'm like, don't fucking do it. Don't 
Don't tell me what to do! And then he heals you with his healing hugs. Yeah. This has become kind of a signature Nicole song. How do you feel about singing this one all the time now? This is, this is your tune. Um, I was definitely, like, scary at first, like all the songs. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I like that um, at first I was definitely, like, terrified to take it over. Um, and Mike does a little bit of the echoing because it's a little low in my range. So he does that, like, we do a little, like, call and response, the beat in the verses and there was like one rehearsal where you guys were like you don't have to try and sing it exactly like tim nicole <laughs> and i was like oh okay <laughs> and um so i started loosening up a little bit and now i kind of just sing it a, like almost the same but just a little bit different and mike changed some of the i think just his part background vocals so the background vocals sound different now and i think it supports my voice a little bit more because to go from a male singing the lead to a female, like it's lower in my range. So I can sing it as loud as I want and it's never gonna sound like a guy singing it in their range. So I think we made some adjustments and um, I definitely loved singing this one. It's definitely fun when you sing it. It's got a little bit of a different feel to it. And you know, there's, there's a part there at the end where you, you do the big powerful kind of voice thing. I don't know how to describe it because I'm not a singer, but it's- I just go up to a higher note that I did one time at a gig without ever practice. I was just <laughs> like, uh, okay, uh, now we're here. <laughs> like pulled it out of my butt um, um and everyone's like that was great and i'm like okay i'll try to redo that every time <laughs> so, so tim these were your lyrics because this is this was your song man this was I, i'm pretty sure i remember these were yours right or no were these for you i think it was a collaboration between me and mike i think yeah i didn't write all the lyrics i think <clears throat> i think i came up with the time is now and i think that's pretty much that's pretty much all i have to put credit to this song i think you came up with more than that i think we just i think you came up with something and i basically just kind of edited it so in other words like took a line out put a line in that rhymed with it stuff like that i think that's how we did that i, I enjoyed this one live well one the sitar the 45 minute sitar solo which was never the same twice no, never no never. never i liked it because i always would cue gary and i liked gary's little bass intro but like i have to say tim i i really enjoyed i thought you sang phenomenal on this one like this was a great tim song like i don't think there's a single song between laser echoes or hair <laughs> that i i I don't like your singing. I think it's phenomenal, but this one I think is is a is, is a gem in the uh, in the crown. I like that. I like this one very much. As well, a, this one was this was the character's you know crowning achievement song. Really, I mean that was that character's main focus for you know songs on the album. So it kind of had to be something memorable, I guess. But uh, yeah, it, it was good fun, lots of fun, and playing drums at the same time, which is you know. Do you remember Tim? how mad you were at me that you would confuse the first lyrics of each line and I wrote the Yeah, lyrics. you wrote the lyrics so much more drum head, but it was definitely needed at the time. Because yeah. you, you pulled me aside one day and you're like, man, I can't, I can't get these two lines straight. Which one comes first? And I don't sing, so I'm like, I don't know. So I went home and I listened to it. I'm like, okay. Came back the next day. I'm like, hey, you know what we should do? I'm like, we should write it on your snare. You don't write that on my snare. And I was like, oh, I just wrote it on your snare. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it, it worked out though, right? It did though. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, that's something we haven't talked about yet too. Is like assigning characters for vocal parts in this album because we didn't do, have that with Laser Fortress. Laser Fortress wasn't character centric, whereas Death of the Herald was. So Quinn was right. This, this song is the first time that Aldous Bray, the creator of Life, like Infinite Life Extension, kind of talks. You know, well, like you could say Herald of Life, but this is the first time he kind of addresses the masses. This is sort of like his his big speech saying, you know, the end of this is the end of death. This is the end of suffering and sorrow. You can live forever, and and it, you don't have to, you know like I, I thought it was it was really cool, and you had the perfect voice for it. I mean, we were talking we were talking last week about Clone and your voice on Clone, and it was just like how you could possibly every time we did it live, which was a handful, a handful of times, just hit those really like that song starts at a ten. You know, that song is just <laughs> right out of the shoot. That one's yeah, where well, that one starts at like eleven. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, when we were, and when we practiced it, we would have to do it like so many times because the timing was so screwy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was me singing that first note like 14 times of practice. It was off, man. Yeah, that was. Um, but this is another one. This is, you know, when we would rehearse Essential Arms and stuff, you know, this is another one that when we would have to redo it, because you had to get those vocal harmonies. We rarely, rarely, rarely ever train wreck this particular song, Essential Arms. Like we were talking last week, some songs we would do, and it was like, okay. This one we generally got, but it took a long time before we got it live, so we would rehearse it a lot. 
to get the harmonies. And, you know, that's, that's a strain on anybody's voice to do 8, 9, 10, 13, 15 times, sometimes for us in a row. As we discussed last week, we were a little intense back in the day. Not so much anymore, but we were a little intense. Uh, a New Beginning. A New Beginning, super, super fun for me, but I don't recall much of the writing of this, or even recording of this. That's but. because the new, A New Beginning, like the, I think the majority of it was written, musically, the majority of it was written before 1974 was even a band. It was Dan Niederhauser, Nick Garofolo, myself, and Pat the Thamavong. We, we, had, we uh, I think this was called like Sunport's Jam or something like that. It was recorded at Nick's house, Nick Garofolo, um, with that lineup, those four people. Nick and I were on guitar, Pat was on the drums, and uh, Dan Niederhaus was on the bass, and it was an instrumental. And then we took it, we turned it into a song called Dance for 1974's first train wreck atrocity um, music oh, that ever to record. I remember it! <laughs> it's awful. It's, it's awful. Oh, and I remember, Clima, you were the one that you were the one that said you were listening to that song. You're like, a lot of this has to go, but some of it needs to stay and be, and be reworked into a new song. Well, see, that was the benefit of me coming in, and then Angela after me is we could listen to older stuff completely non-biased, not caring about it because we had no stake in it. You know, like we didn't create it, we didn't record it, we didn't have parts in it. And I remember when we were getting together to try and start writing this album, I had been listening to some of the older stuff just to to learn some of it because we were talking about you know, oh, we got to learn more off laser and do this. So when I went back and listened to it, yeah, the song itself was absolute garbage, but like it had, it had moments in it. And to be fair, it wasn't garbage because it was garbage. It was garbage because we were, you guys, I mean, this was like a long time ago. Nobody knew what we were doing and, and nobody knew what we were writing. There were a lot, you know, it was just this really mishmash of just awfulness, but there were some parts in it and some structural things that were super, super interesting. I brought it back to 4G and said, here's what I think we should use. And lo and behold, it became a new beginning. And a new beginning is the first time we get the lead vocal stylings of Angela. Yeah, it was great. I fucking love singing that song. We do it still. I don't think we've done it in a while, but I mean, I think with the current lineup, we always say that because John's been in the band for like two months, but we've only got to rehearse twice with him because... One of those was the audition, I think. Correct, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, John... Uh, early in the band. Song <laughs> 497 that you now have to go learn after these podcasts. <laughs> New beginning is fun. Uh, new beginning is not too terribly difficult either. But um, no, and that's yeah. when we're like Angela sang it so well that I'm like I I can't. It, I just try to do my, the best I can to like have, sort of sing it as good. <laughs> just like channel your inner like Cher slash <laughs> Diana Ross, and no, you'll be fine. These, these songs like Essential Arms, New Beginning, Vera are like. The like some big, some of the big fan favorites. The Holy Trinity. Band, they were my favorite. So when you guys are like Nicole, you sing it. I'm like, okay, sure. I'll try. <laughs> and, like, I like overthinking. Get so stressed because I want to like do it justice. Uh, but they're such good songs. The originals are just oh, just perfect. <laughs> and one of the most complicated one parts Nick has ever had to learn that the intro. Kick, 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 kick. <laughs> Tim, Tim, you'd be very proud. He nails your little bell dings in there. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Nails them. No, New Beginnings was really fun for me. I get to play kind of like a little funk guitar part, you know, much like I was doing kind of the funk keyboard stuff uh, with Got Our Hands. Like, I get to, like, that's fun for me. That's, that's kind of a no-brainer song. I can just sit back and do so that's fun um, yeah just really quickly story-wise what that means uh, so it's a back and forth between angela and myself i'm singing from the standpoint of someone who's like all excited about infinite life extension like hey we can live forever this is awesome we have nothing to be afraid of anymore and angela sings as her character vera vera hunter the leader of the temps anti-cloning anti-digital ma mapping sort of thing and she's basically saying hey this just came out we should probably not all be like yeah let's 100 percent do that and like sell our minds and all, all that sort of stuff she does it with ferocity that's right do you know who vera is named after do you kitty my cat yeah tell us who are the three characters that were all right so again we go from laser which is written just as just laser this one becomes much more character centric and it's written lyrically especially as characters singing their and expressing story points from their points of view who are the three characters and who represents them in the album 
Tim is Aldous Braes. He's the creator of the technology to clone yourself, mind-wise at least. Angela is Vera Hunter. She is the leader of the rebellion against the, the ability to do that for whatever reasons. And then the third one is Admiral Tackett, who Gary is the one who voices his songs. And Admiral Tackett is uh, someone who sees the technology of being able to save your consciousness and has an idea to kind of weaponize it and turn it into a military um, tactic. Military tactic. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, just as a side note, do you remember when almost all of the band crashed in my apartment and we were trying to come up with names for the for the characters? Oh yeah, you're right. No, I do. Yep, you're right. Yeah. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah, and we were like, we need a name for for Tackett. And we we're like Tackett. We we're like, well, what's his first name? And it was Thumb Thumb Tackett. <laughs> it was, yeah, we're so stupid. Yeah, it was Heart Attack It. Um, what was? I can't remember any of the other ones, but like, I just remember, you know, it was that was insanity. Oh. Was it ever Admiral Tackett? Ka, 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 ka? No. <laughs> you ought to know that. Oh, that would have been good. Actually, my my favorite was. Um, Kunta Kinte Tackett. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's definitely one we thought of. It's so stupid. Oh, yeah, it was all dumb. It was all dumb and great. We were not smart people. Oh, we could have kept Welcome to Earth. That's right. If we had kept Welcome to Earth, we could have kept Heart Attack. Vera becomes one of... Again, it's so weird to say this because nobody knows us. There's like seven people on the entire planet Earth that, that know who we are. But Vera became something we kind of sort of got known for. So much so that that song got nominated when they used to do the CT Music Awards. We played it at the Bushnell. We did play that song at the Bushnell. Angela knocked it out of the park on this particular tune. Just phenomenal from top to bottom singing on that one. Thank you. But Mike wrote it all. I was just gonna uh, say the riff. The riff was four G, right? No, uh, the the riff was mine. Da 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 da. The verse was uh, Gary. Gary wrote that verse. Yeah, but you wrote all the the vocal lines. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you you were very kind to me. Well, <laughs> well have can, can I ask for what your range was when I? Because I remember like you know there were so songs that I wrote that I wasn't I knew I wasn't going to be singing so I had to be aware of when I was doing harmonies or writing a song I knew I wasn't going to be singing to like write for the register of the person who's been singing it so. I think you heard me sing so much because I never stopped singing that you probably just figured out my range <laughs> well it was perfect I mean you sounded you sounded great singing it and uh yeah I remember I remember we performed a song before it even had vocals before there were any lyrics and there were any vocals we performed it at, at that at, biker bar yes yes yes, yes. yes. Where the dude we thought we were gonna get shot. Yes. Like, where the dude stole one of our hoodies. And yeah, we were, yeah, man. Oh man. But that was a song they loved. That was the song. <laughs> so um, the, the, one of the guys came up to us afterwards and was like, "That song, the one that had no lyrics to it, that was awesome." And that was Vera. And I was like, "Oh, we, yeah, we wrote that. We're not, we're not done with it yet." But that gave us a lot of gave us a lot of hope that that song would be good. And yeah, um, I, do. I have a very fond memory of doing that. Uh, instrumentally at that the only thing I didn't like about that gig was wh where should 1974 never play at a biker fundraiser memorial full of like hell's angels rejects oh my god that place was terrifying and our merch kept getting taken and finally we saw this one huge biker dude wearing like one of our hoodies with the earth with the Roman numerals on it we're like uh, who's, who's <laughs> Who sold that guy a hoodie? And we're all like, nobody get in the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Vera, I have a lot of fond memories of Vera, too. I, I still enjoy playing that song. And I, yeah, that was, that was fun to play at the Bushnell. That was, that was kind of a surreal moment, at least for me in this band. Uh, that was like one of the happiest moments of my life. <laughs> I've been seeing musicals at the Bushnell since I was like four. So for me to be on the Bushnell stage in like my ridiculous green velvet and sequin gown, like man, I was living dress. my best life. It was yeah, it was my Mulan dress. And in addition to that, we had two people doing a choreography to it, like some sort of weird dance off the Oh something. yeah. I forgot. Oh, about I that. I I forgot about that too. So and have... I didn't use sheet music for it when we played at the Bushnell. Uh, we had done 
so many shows and like at every show we pretty much played that song so. i still it was the only song i ever played with that sheet music <laughs> and the song itself is basically just about it's about beer saying kind of what she said in a new beginning but she got her own song for it more powerful because a new beginning is more like i don't know if we should do that and then in the song beer she's like we should not do that <laughs> I have decided that we're definitely not doing that. Yep, this put down, nah. And then, do we, do we see Vera again in this album? Uh, no. No, I don't think so. Um, she's part of the United Earthlands Assembly, like the, right. the story, but she's not. Um, she's not. I don't think her vocals appear again um, in the album because I think what happens is in the United Earthlands Assembly, she gets attacked. And then the the ruling happens that, you know, Aldous Braze is allowed to do his thing. And then the temps kind of, like, mobilize. And then in Echoes of War, she's actually still around. And I, I still like to think that in the song Interlude and Laser Fortress, you know, when they're going to, you know, when that one that one guy is just trying to find the secret hideout of the temps, that beer is there with, like a like, an awesome eye patch and some scars and stuff like that, like, this is how we're going to blow up the moon. <laughs> she's, still, she's still rocking it. After Vera comes Admiral Tackett, so we've got two introductory songs for characters right back to back, Vera being Vera and Admiral Tackett being Admiral Tackett. And as you had said, this is vocalized by Gary. It's a cowboy song. It, well, you know why it's a cowboy song. Because you're a cowboy. Because I wrote it with Gary. So the second you get Climber writing a song, you're going to get either a Beatles song or a country tune. Well, it doesn't help that they're sliding it. It doesn't help that they're sliding it. Uh, you played the slide on that beautifully, by the way. So oh, that, the slide makes that a little bit for me. Yeah, it's, it's basically the beginning of Breaking Bad, so. <laughs> oh my god, it is! But for Admiral Tackett, I, I distinctly remember Gary had the majority of that with the chords and whatnot. Yep, and, and the only you. thing that was missing was Gary was like, we need a way to like open it and do something. And I came up with the dun da da dun 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 like a, like a funeral dirge kind of thing. And Tim, I think it was you that were like, "That's that's awesome. You need to keep that. That has to be in the beginning of that song." And so we, yeah, I don't I don't doubt that at all. But outside of that, that's all I kind of remember is Gary had the vocals and the chordal structure together. Um, oh, you know what else I feel like I contributed to the the what would be I guess the bridge sections. The yeah, Gary wrote, Gary wrote pretty much all the music. He wrote all the lyrics. Even the part that I sang is Gary's lyrics. I think I did the I think I did the melody for it, and it was cut from things because Gary writes in stream of consciousness, so he had like this whole page of things to say, <laughs> and and he we kept a lot of it. It was just okay. We need to verse it. This is chorus. This is second verse. Yeah, that sort of thing. And I, we switched some stuff around, but like yeah. I love Admiral Tackett. I think that is an underappreciated song. Just like Clone is underappreciated. For, for Tackett, yeah. Uh, that's really all I remember. And I remember we recorded that one fairly quickly, too. Like, some of the songs we, we would agonize over to get things right or get vocals right. But I remember that one kind of, we just kind of went in. Gary knew what he had to do. I think you probably laid down the scratch track, and then I did the rest. Tim had the drums done in two or three takes, and that was it. And I, I don't remember that song. I, maybe the reason it doesn't stick in my head as monumentally as some of the other stuff is... I remember that being fairly smooth. Although I will say one thing that sticks out to me is, do you remember to do your slide part, how stupid loud those amp, that amp was? Do you remember, like, even when we shut the door in the live room, which you could usually not hear anything once that happened, it was like rumbling Jeff's house. When you I don't know what he part. did. Whatever Jeff we did to record that slide, there is no way that I've ever been able to replicate the sound of that slide guitar live, ever. No guitar, no amp, no slide. It, like, it sounds really, it sounds like, uh, this is going to sound weird, but it sounds like smoke. When you listen to it, it just has that smoky feel to it, that sound to it. And I've never been able to re replicate it live. I don't think we've really played it live, but the one time we did the CD release show. Again, that's a tragedy. <laughs> It's so good. We're going to have to do like a fourth or fifth podcast with Jeff on the production of this album and uh, Echoes. The uh, Admiral Tackett comes out of Admiral Tackett into United Earthlands Assembly. A, a very short song, right? Isn't this one that's like kind of short? If Isn't this the... There's no singing. There, there is. There's the violence in the council hall part, which is all harmony. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. 
But this is a song again. It was seen as more of like a. Um, it's a story based thing. It's not like a. It's not a single. It's no verses and choruses or anything like that. It's literally just. It's a part of the story that's important. So it told through a ruling of uh, of a judge. Uh, that's really three people arguing. It's it's Aldous Bray's arguing for his technology to stay his own. It's Vera arguing for his technology is unconstitutional and should be eradicated. And it's Tackett arguing that his technology should be, be it should be able to be um, used by the military to develop defenses. And um, and the judge rules that Aldous Bray's is the only one who he's he's the one in control of it, so he can choose what to do with it. So Vera can go pound sand, and uh, an Admiral Tag can go pound sand as well, and then a riot basically breaks out. Um, Does anybody remember, because I don't, who the guy was that did the role of the judge? If anyone would remember it, it would be Angela, because no, I have no clue. Angela, do you remember who Jeff hired to do the voiceover as the judge in that song? It was Kevin Anderson. That's it! Kevin Anderson. Kevin Anderson. So Jeff, I love that angel. <laughs> so, he was my okay. professor also. Yes. Oh, okay. Since this was much more character-centric, you know, Vera, Gary, uh, and Tim all taking the roles of these characters, when it came to the point that we needed some sort of outcome, we needed to progress the story to make it so what was happening and why why is this the death of the Herald and, and what what causes this? And obviously there's some sort of trial and litigation because everybody has a stance on, you know, as 4G was just saying, Vera doesn't want it to get out and all this other stuff. So when Jeff and, and 4G and I were sitting down talking, and was it just me, Jeff? And 4G? I don't remember, but when there was a group conversation with the band, there needed to be a small portion of narrative, not singing, just narrative. And I think everybody in the band, all of us, all five of us, had a shot at writing the dialogue. Am I correct with that? That would that Kevin Anderson eventually said. I don't remember that. Um, uh, I, remember, I, remember, I remember it was Mike. I think I remember writing the dialogue. What he ended up speaking, I remember I wrote, but uh, like the day that he came to the studio. <laughs> um, but he's a professional. The, the songs that the songs that um the songs that required narration usually I did, but we wanted. Uh, like a like a very low voice for the judge because me me saying that would be like your fifteen year old brother trying to tell you what's up and like you just like oh you know just get out of my room Kyle come on Kyle <laughs> <laughs> we wanted someone that sounded like they actually dropped both testicles we wanted someone that had a lower register to their voice so Evan um, Anderson is the lowest voice I've ever heard yeah so he was perfect for that. And he um, reads it so unemotionally. It was just a very matter-of-fact read. That's ex and that's exactly what we wanted. Right, yeah. So that was no, he was perfect for that. Um, and then I also remember we did something really interesting musically with this song because you can't really hear unless you're paying attention, but with all of the newscast flashing that's going on at the tail end of the song after the singing, the music slows down. The tempo slows down. Like Each pass gets slower and slower and slower until it transitions into the tempo of A Dark Thought, which is the next song, which is really cool. We didn't, that, thought, that was a song we couldn't use a metronome on. We had to just kind of feel our way through that. And then that was that. And I thought what was most interesting with that, and this was, Jeff did this. We got roughs of the mixes, you know, a day or two after we would leave the studio. And Jeff put in there, you know, there's, there's the fake newscasts. Once the judge says, this is the verdict, stylistically, you, you get the, the fake newscasts, right? And we yeah, all, the, you get you get the singing first. So there's, yeah. there's harmony, violence in the council halls, which is like because yeah, it's after like the which is the, the gavel. Gavel, yeah. Yeah, and then, yeah. then and then you get Mike yelling pandemonium in the courtroom. <laughs> That's right. That was one of them. Um, <laughs> but what was what was really interesting is if you listen to that, not only does the music slow down, but he starts to stretch and manipulate the voices, and it gets real weird. Oh, yeah. And the idea was that um, Tackett goes home after this trial, sits down in kind of a depression, you know, drinking maybe, and turns on the TV, and he's flipping through these newscasts, and it's just this oversaturation of this giant trial of the century that he lost. And it's just him kind of looping into the idea that he's going to do something drastic and he's changing as a character at this point. And that was all Jeff. We had no knowledge this was going to happen. And we got the uh, 
the rough mixes and we heard it, we were just like, oh my god, this is brilliant. The first ever, the first ever, the first ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, I thought it was it was really well done. We all kind of were like, that's why didn't we think of that? That's so cool. And it really is a great way of starting to see the changing in the story of that character as to what's going to happen at the end of this album. Well, so yeah. we, were, we were definitely using, you know, story ideas and story architecture to create this album especially this album we made it so that admiral tackett wasn't just like he's not just an admiral i mean admiral's a very very high-ranking officer um but he actually had done he'd seen battle like he was a part of the great galactic war and suffered from ptsd so he's not all there so that kind of made his 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 stubbornness to do what he thinks is right in a very terrible way, which is the whole rest of this album and, and part of Echoes of War. Um, that's kind of how we gave him his background to justify kind of what he does. Because, spoiler alert for the end of this album, he ends up kidnapping Aldous Braze, forcing him to weaponize the... Uh, the <laughs> I know, right? Shocking! Forcing him to weaponize the technology and then kills him. And Aldous Braze is the Herald of Life, which is the third song on the album. Herald of Life is referring to Aldous Braze. I don't remember a lot about Dark Thought. The only thing I remember about Dark Thought, and I think was really interesting, was the introduction of Angela on an album as Vera with this big, big vocal. Angela, you're very subdued in your singing, very quiet and calm and, and gentle in the singing. And I thought that was such an interesting contrast. Very well done, but a very interesting contrast to a this Dark Thought. This came out of a jam session. This, this and uh, and and United Earthlands as well and Ultimatum all came out of that same jam session. It was so long. I remember I had it on my computer and like I think I was the only person who ever tried to sing during the jam session. And I did say "Hush, Hush Now" in and that like made it into the song somehow and yeah. sort of like created it. That's right. It was "Hush, Hush Now, Don't Don't Turn Out the Light" or something like that. Yes, that was it, and that's the beginning of my singing in that song. And I was. I was pretty proud of that. Yeah, no, the, the yeah, the end of the United Earthlands Assembly came out of actually United Earthlands Assembly came out of that jam. Then it went into that. I think it went in like we jammed into a dark thought, but it was long. It was yeah. like an hour or more even. I would, remember that would have been that would have been Gary too. Gary's the one that's always like, hey, let's just jam, let's just roll, jam and see, see what happens. Yeah, I wanted to fight him. But then, we got three, but then we got three songs out of it. I know, I know. <laughs> that was a cool song. I like that song. I love that song. I thought that was like one of the coolest character defining songs because it was like meant to be like this like madness, which is why I wanted it to be like so different from Vera because it was like this like this soft, gentle voice that was supposed to be leading someone to do terrible things. Yeah, sort of like the... Like a siren song. I wanted this to be a siren song. It was the it was the devil with angel wings. Yeah, precisely. Out of a dark thought comes abduction. Uh, an interesting pairing of songs. Abduction starts with the Wurlitzer piano. Am I correct on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Played by Angela. I kind of sort of remember. I had gone off to my studio down in Pennsylvania and wrote what became the intro to that. I didn't write much more of the song, but that kind of strikes me as something I did. The D E D C part? So the intro is just those two, you know, three chords, D E D C. And then da 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 Oh, I thought that was Gary. I mean, I don't know. I didn't write that, so I'm not sure. That was you? But, I, but I, I distinctly kind of remember, I wrote that one kind of alone, just not being here in Connecticut. Just those two parts, just that little intro, a couple of chords, and then that little riff that's right after it. Everything else after that, I kind of remember being, it was me, Angela, Tim, and Gary in the sun porch. Forge, you may have been in California. I think I was in California, yeah. Um, and we, we, the four of us, got together and wrote the rest of that song and sent it to you, I think. Yep, I remember hearing That's that. That's when I wrote, um, what's it called, too? Yes, Hero Life. Oh, yeah. yeah, that because that's, yeah, you were, you were dad, and dad wasn't here, so we didn't know what to do, so we just started messing around. Sounded great. No, I remember you sent me that. I remember it, we were talking about, like, the da 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 was like someone, like, kicking in a door, like, 
was like, yeah, I could get down on that. Yeah, I don't remember who wrote what in this song other than you guys did the whole first part of this and then the dum ba dum ba da da ba Like after pretty much the, like the main two verses, I think it was Gary. It sounds very Gary-ish. Uh, that, that was Gary because, again, we were all, it was just the four of us. You weren't there. You were across the country. You know, typical Gary going, hey, we should do this. Hey, we should do that. And it got weirder and weirder and weirder. And thankfully, like, Andrea and I were like, you know, yeah, we could just reel that in just a little bit. And then, you know, there's, that was kind of how that song came together. I think I did the part after that, like the balance of the paradigm part. I think I wrote the chords for that because they're very major. Like, usually if there's like a really major chord progression written, that's very not, like, doesn't far, stray too far from, like, the pop sounds of things is usually me. Um, and then the guitar part over top of that. And we kept ch modulating it, which I think probably was Gary's idea too. Oh my God, the modulations. That was one of my favorite things to play live was those like I, yeah. crazy modulations. It was so much fun. I, I really did like playing that song live. We tried briefly to bring it back, but we didn't have enough time to practice it to do that. So... Um, It'll come back. Oh, there's no, there's no question. John, song number 562 to add to the list. <laughs> it's a um, good song, John. It's a real good song. I remember working out, well, not me doing it, but I remember how Gary and I would just, like, you know, Tim and Angela would go out and, you know, write or do something or whatever, and I remember me and Gary just playing with the, you know, like the chords behind it. And you getting that solo together at the end was was a lot of time because it, it doesn't stay in the same spot. So, you, you know, the fingerings had to change, the chordal structure had to change, so all the solo and scale changed. I remember doing that for, oh, for forever. But, I mean, it sounds great, and, and you play it phenomenally, 4G. But um, I just remember working on that song because it starts off pretty straightforward. Yeah. You know, very typical me writing, you know, it starts off pretty simplistic. And then as, you know, you and Gary and Angela and Tim kind of get going on it, it gets a little bit more interesting. It's an abduction, you know? It shouldn't be pretty straightforward. The most brilliant battle song to ever be written in the 1974 catalog, Ultimatum. This Ultimatum is makes me cry. Like, sometimes when I listen to it, I, I do, like, for some reason, that song, it just, it makes me cry. Like, it's just, it gets guys, so sad. The guy's bullied and tortured into yeah, it's so giving awesome. away uh, thing, yeah. And I think that it is the best that Timothy and Gary's voice sound on the album, personally. I think that song is just like, oh, what's the part? What's the part, Timothy? There's a part that you sing that is so good. And what that's the part that makes me cry in Ultimatum. Tim, do you remember the lyrics to this? Oh, Jesus. It, you know, if, I, if it starts off, it'll all come flooding back to me. But who remembers me running down the street in cowboy boots? Me! With a lab coat on. Oh, yeah! <laughs> next to a moving vehicle. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was fantastic. You were Aldous Braves for the uh, ALS um, ice bucket water challenge thing. Yes, that's what it was. Thank you. That thing's up on YouTube. That thing still makes me smile. If you watch that, we did that all in like the span of like two to three hours as a response to being nominated by Isaac Young, I think. And I think that it came out looking really funny. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's cheeseburger soup, if I can quote Tim, but it's amazing. Angela has, <laughs> has the line. I remember from listening, it's my virtue lost its innocence. The future turns to gray. That part, that part, every time I get so emotional because it's it's so soft and sad when you say my virtue lost its innocence and it's like uh, uh, oh god it's so sad <laughs> it's so good I love it I love it it's the best you've ever sounded there you go. that's your compliment that's your free compliment for the day everyone gets one yeah. I think I think playing that song live was brilliant because it was so fun to watch. Gary and Tim vocally dueled and battled it out. And every time we did it, it was so much fun. One of my memories that sticks in my head about this is this came out of that jam session and we had to significantly alter it into what it is, into Ultimatum, because when we went back and listened to it and we're like, oh, we got this great riff. We had managed to rewrite The Stranger by Billy Joel pretty, pretty, pretty dead on. Yeah, so we're like, oh crap, 
we were like, okay, well, we can't rewrite The Stranger by Billy Joel, so we ended up writing Ulti um, Ultimatum. I remember you were so mad about that. You were like, God damn it! This was so good! This was so good! Actually, the same thing happened with Essential Arms. I originally wrote Essential Arms on the, on a piano, not a guitar, and it was freaking um, Clocks by Coldplay. <laughs> we, we were really good at rewriting songs that had already been written. Like, we were great at it. That is absolutely true. The forte we had. The other thing I remember was we were trying to work out the solo for this, and this was another one where it was like, okay, guys, just play the song on loop, you know, 40, 50 times. My obsession with delay at the time, and you were like, guys, stop playing your guitar solo underwater, because I had so much crap on the guitar just to try to make it work. Every and, guitar yeah. solo on the album is underwater. <laughs> <laughs> Every guitar solo. I was saying to Fuji on the phone, what, yesterday or the day before, I, I want to go back and re-record that album. I'm very displeased with my own performance. I had a lot of growing up to do as a musician, and unfortunately... Of course you would say that. Yeah, are you... What, what? You have to get me back from Florida. <laughs> That's not happening right now, because no one's going anywhere right now. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but yeah, Tim, tell us... You wrote some of the... I'm pretty sure those lyrics were yours, weren't they? I, or were they oh, for which, you? Which one, which one are we talking about here? Ultimatum. No, I don't think I... Think so Ultimatum? I don't think... I think Gary wrote the lyric. Not that I was there, but we play the song still, like, every show. I think Gary yeah. wrote Gary wrote his lyrics. You can tell because his lyrics don't... One line of one lyric doesn't line up with the others. They're, like, true composed. Tim's line up perfectly. I think I wrote those because... Because <laughs> I can't write like Gary writes. I can't write... Constantly changing the meter of the lines, like that mine repeat a lot. Tim, what was it like playing that live and, and singing back and forth with Gary? Basically, yell singing at Gary. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> but what I remember the most about playing that song is that he would religiously turn around and just stare me down while I was singing. <laughs> he would just like stare me down, and when he was singing, he would like sing at me. It was great. It was good stuff. It was really good. That was a fun one. That was that was a super fun one. It, I think it was also I think it was also fun because you have the bass player and the drummer singing, and those are usually not the members of the band that sing, and they're fighting. It's like great. This is perfect. <laughs> well, we, we were talking about that a little bit last podcast. Is we would walk in, they'd say, "How many microphones?" We're like, "Oh, you know, four. And the drummer sings, and they'd be just like. God damn it, really? Does your drummer have to sing? Because sound people hated the fact that we had a singing drummer. Hated it. Yeah, and they also hated the headset, too. Oh, my God. Oh, the headset! Because, because they basically... The, the headset was looked at as like a floating snare mic. I they hated about it. That. When we did the CD release at Trinity on Main, even the sound guy was, you know, he was fine. He was great. He was nice. He did a great job. But he was like... Mixing with that snare with the singer with, on a headset, he's like, "That's so hard to do," and we're like, "Sorry." <laughs> yeah, <I'm laughs> we so we opened the album on this huge epic, the Great Galactic War, and we ended on <laughs> the biggest a cute, number, a cute ever. little number, a pretty little ditty, yeah, a little a little pop to it. Now on on this huge, this this to me rivals the overture in in scale. Not it's they're different in in stylistically, but in scale, Death of the Herald. I think everybody had a part we wrote in this. 4G, take it. I just, I don't even know where to begin with this particular song. Hold, here is the light. So first of all, I, I wrote that in in California, that, that first 50 second whatever, and it's the overture done in a major key. You're too fucking smart, you know that? You make me mad. You're so <laughs> smart. Uh, so there's that written in a major key, and then the rest of it, God, I don't know. I think Gary wrote a lot of the beginning stuff. Da -ba -da 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 -ba -da -da -da. I think it was Gary. Definitely the ba -da 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 -ba -da -da like the Dracula, yes. the Dracula tune. Yeah, that was that was Gary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it always reminds me of like a song I should be on like a Halloween mix or something like that. And uh, he wrote the lyrics. He wrote the melody to that part when that's done. So that's basically, um, I think, Tackett trying to figure out whether he should kill Braze or not he, because, because Braze gave him what he wanted. And then Braze sings the whole, the purpose has run, which I think I did the lyrics and the vocals for that. I don't know who did the chords for that. Yeah, I don't know who did the chords for that. So good. 
Um, it's all so good. Stop them so good. We're the best. All right. Stop the podcast. Yeah. We're the best. We're the best. <laughs> and then from that, it goes into a solo that I climb. I don't know if you wrote the chords for that. The um, But Lou from Fairwood did the solo for that. He recorded that. Yeah. So I wrote I wrote that little part just to, as, as, as like a breakup coming out of, out of Gary's part. And you and I both took a stab at the solo there. And like we did that in studio. That wasn't something we had demoed out. And we did it in studio for like the better part of a day. We wasted a lot of time. You know, you took a shot, I took a shot. We went back and forth, tried it again. And finally, at the end of the day, we were like, we don't play the types of solos that need to go in this particular thing. It needed a very... It needed like, to sound like a ghost. like an yeah, it, it, needed, it needed like Dave Gilmore times a million, you know, and I can do a pretty good Gilmore, but, but it needed something a little bit more ethereal, almost, you know, something like that. And we all were like, hey, you know who's got the chops to do this way above and beyond us? Uh, Lou Lorenzo from Fairwood. We sent him a message that day and sent him, you know, that clip of the song. And I think he came in within a day or two. And, and again, much like Isaac with that saxophone thing, I think he did maybe two or three passes. And then on the fourth pass, that's what's on the album right now. I remember when he was tracking, he was recording his solos. And his solos, like like everything he tracked, it, they were all the same. Like they were, like he wrote the solo. He wasn't, he wasn't improving. And we were listening back to them and... We, I could not hear a difference in them. And he really liked the last one because he would do one. He'd be like, nah, I don't like this little thing. And like, you know, like you're, you're your own worst critic. So like he, we did it until he felt comfortable with it. And then he finally, like he was happy with the last one. So that's what we went with. We had trouble. We played that song. Well, we tried to play that song. There's a, that was our clone discovery of that album. Yep. Uh, we tried to play it live. I don't know, more than once, certainly more than once. And not one single time was it ever anything we should talk about. But I do remember that it was hard for you. I think you tried it once doing the solo there. I think I tried it once doing the solo there. It just was so far out of either of our wheelhouses that it just wasn't going to be something we could do. True. Live, in a live performance. That well, and also right after that, right? So there's a couple other parts that happen after that. I think you wrote the next part, that that sounds like you thing. Yeah, I, yeah, that was right, yep. And then... The part after that, which is the bot, I think that was Gary. That sounds very Gary. I remember that was Gary, and I don't actually. That's that's one little tiny section of the song. I don't actually play on that. That's you and Gary. There is no second part. There is no second guitar part in that little really twenty second chunk of that song. And then after that is the gigantic operatic part. I'll let you and Tim and Angela speak on that. That was awesome. That was the death of the Herald. Yeah, it was great. We got a bunch. We got a bunch. Thinking. Got a, a bunch of people in to yeah. uh, record that. We got uh, who was it? Uh, Leah Lorenzo. Yep. Lou's wife, wife was in there. Jennifer Hill was in there. Oh yeah, I forgot Jennifer Hill was there. Uh, Angela, you were doing one of the voices too, right? Oh yeah. Uh, we had. I was in there. Tim was in there. I think Gary was in there, and Steve Gregory was in there. He was someone that we played with once at Zen Bar. And we put out like, I'm like, hey, we need male vocals to do like this big, big thing. And he was, I think he was the only one that was like, yeah, I'll do it for the men that weren't members of the band. So, oh, yeah. yeah. That's so nice of him. So we got him in there, that big Latin, like, thing. it sounds really cool. Just listen to it now. I'm like, dang, that sounds BA. Yeah, it's really good. It's just we could never do it live. It's not our fault. Right. No, it's just the way it's written. We don't, we don't have a, 25 piece choir section that's like operatic that can back us up and sing that and Forgy played on the keyboard the string section and i played the timpanis the fake timpanis that are in there um oh yeah i kind of remember that yeah yeah that comes in and halfway through that part yeah 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 i remember that and then there's the sound effect the race mortality that's right. Tim's voice, isn't it? That's you, isn't it, buddy? Yeah, I think so. I'm pretty sure that's my in my best in my best whispery Sunday whisper. Yeah, no, that was you. I think I'm very certain. Like that was being... that was definitely you on that one doing that. It's so creepy too. Um, and then Matt, and then the end with like the dual guitar harmonies was really fun. So this album shies away from the sound effects except for that little tiny part there's a fake gavel that was done with a snare drum hit uh what else am i missing here that 
qualifies as sound effects. Uh, uh, there's like, I mean, there's like the ch of like the radio, or the TV switching in like United Earthlands Assembly, like that. Oh, I, that was done with, I think some, I think Jeff had done a little bit of the sound effects at the end to bridge the two ending parts of uh, the Death of the Herald. And he did the sound effects to do the fake radio slash TV channel changing. Yeah. So this was a little different. Laser had, I don't want to say more sound effects, but certainly, certainly different sound effects where these were more interjected musically. Why? Was it, was it Harold that had uh, the explosion dubbed in? Oh, for, um, I know you're talking about, it happens twice. It's a timpani, but yeah, yeah, that happens in um, New Beginning before the guitar solo. That's right, yes. That's what you're talking about, right, Tim? With the, with the big explosion? I think so, yeah. You know, and it happens again at the end in Death of the Herald, right before the... Uh, the vocals come in, like the, the Latin vocals. Yes. Um, I remember that now. Yeah. I remember when we got, the, we got the rough spec, we were just listening to it, and all of a sudden there's this big, this huge explosion. We're like, Whoa. Well, and originally it was a legit explosion. Like it was a, like an explosion explosion sound. And then we are like, that might be a little too much. And then we just opted for the timpani sound, which was a little bit more, a little bit less. We thought it was a little less cheesy, even though it's still cheesy. A little less cheesy. <laughs> Um, but still has that epic sound to it. Yeah, so I think one of the reasons that we shied away from doing some of the more like recording experimentation and stuff was because when we were doing Laser Fortress, it took about a, it took about, realistically about a year to record and mix that entire album. And we were doing it all ourselves in Tim's sun porch for the most part. I did some stuff in my, my, uh, my room where I was like mixing. Um, like I recorded some guitar stuff and some vocal stuff there. Um, but, uh, we could, we could take our time. We weren't on a time limit. We weren't paying for studio time or anything like that. So we really got to experiment. I feel like there with some of like the sounds. And when we were in Sonic environments, we booked a week. We had a set amount of money that we were spending on this. And we, we already had like the entire CD done out in like demo form. We didn't stray too far away from that for any of the tunes because we knew we were working in someone else's time. So we, uh, we, we did, did a lot less experimentation with recording. It was more just writing. Like this, this song had a lot more thought put into the writing process as opposed to the recording, like the creative recording part of it, I should say. A lot of the creativity that came with recording was just stuff that Jeff would, Jeff would recommend. I want to speak on that a little bit. When we did Laser, it was very DIY and no time scale. Didn't matter what we did, when we did it. You know, it took a long time to do, but who, care, who cared? I want to ask two questions, and the first one, I'm going to actually ask Tim and Angela. We, you guys stayed at the studio a couple nights, correct? Yeah. I did, too. Yes. Oh, you stayed up there, too? Tim and, and 4G. What was the difference between recording Laser and Harold? It wasn't done on the sun porch. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was not. Forge, jump in. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it so much that I was like, I cannot wait to do the next album. Like, we spent, we were fairly intense. Okay, so we spent a week there, but we spent the entire week there. Like, we booked Saturday to Saturday or something crazy, like, or Saturday to Sunday, like, within a week. But we recorded every day. I think the first night was drums. And, Tim, you banged out all the drums within yeah. a day. Within um, 10 hours? 10 hours, I'd say? Yeah, uh, everything. Everything drum was done. And then everything after that was like, I think bass came next, and then guitars came after that, and then we saved vocals for last. Although we might have switched some stuff around because I remember CT Ain't So Bad really wanted to get Angela singing Vera. So I think we bumped that up so that they, like, to fit their schedule so that they could record her doing so that. So it was the reasonable time of day to record it, yeah. Because <laughs> um, we started doing some bass stuff at like 1 o'clock in the morning, and Jeff was like, nope. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Jeff's ever worked with people that were as crazy. I mean, our, our rehearsals on Sundays would be all day things. So we were used to a day of stuff. And, and I don't know about anyone else, but like, I loved doing that entire experience. Like, I didn't want to stop the day because I, I was really enjoying it. I was enjoying the re recording and listening to other people and like doing little notes about this works, this doesn't, what can we change, blah, blah, blah. We ate together. Like, whenever, whoever was there, like, we had a little dinners together and his little table that was cute um so you know, cute. i don't know if timothy and i ever left 
I feel like we see so, I, yeah, I'm, so I, much. I'm, I'm definitely the same way. I never, I, I didn't leave that entire time. I, I got permission to stay there. The only time I remember leaving was Little Ugly had a CD release show. No, 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 but, but Laser for I remember one of the things that I think I really liked about the experience, why, why I enjoyed it so much was, excuse me, Laser Fortress. I was, everyone was recording on my computer and then I had to go home and mix it. And it was a lot of mixing. There's a lot of tracks and, and I just, it was a lot of work for me, for me, not only just to, you know, record my own parts, but to like put everything together and mix it. For this, it was like in the hands of someone else that could probably do it better than me and like way, like such a time saver for me that like, I was like, I was like a kid, you know, it's like, it's like when you go on vacation, if you're the kid, you don't have to worry about anything. When you're the adult, you have to do the planning and like booking rooms and not paying for it and all this sort of stuff. I was like, I was like a kid, you know, like I was, I was doing the fun part. So much so that we went back there for Echoes of War. I was just going to ask, actually, Tim, was it during Echoes or was it during Herald that when they were off doing, it might have been like guitar and bass, so your parts were done, my parts were done. I don't think we had started vocals yet, but we went and ended up cooking this huge meal for everybody. Which album was that? Yeah, that was, that was like prerequisite. We would come up with a menu because yeah. I was doing the chef thing at the time. And uh, you guys would all be like, okay, well, what are you making us? And I'd be like, well, okay, well, let's come up with it. But yeah, what, what was it? We did like chicken parm and we always did some sort of like large Italian pasta dish kind of thing mm -hmm. and we baked we, I remember I baked the cake you made the chicken parm it was a salad but no what I, but the specific part I remember was at least I'm pretty sure it was Harold it could have been Echoes where Tim and I spent the entire day while everybody else was recording just cooking yeah so what, so what I remember is not only learning parts and recording that album but you taught me how to cook too it was awesome good times man good times on those albums hell yeah so, Nobody knew who we were during Laser, and to be fair, nobody still knows who we are. But coming out of Laser, you know, <laughs> we got gigs, and people wanted to know things. And like we talked about in the last, last podcast, we had to learn how to be musicians, essentially. Was, was there any pressure that anybody felt, Angela, Tim, Forge, coming into Death of the Herald? Was, was the feeling of this, and I don't mean the story or the writing, was there any sort of feeling of pressure coming into this album? Because our, our anonymity had been taken away from us. I just wanted yeah. to wear pretty dresses and sing songs. That's all I ever wanted. And I got to do it. You did it very well. Thank you. That's all I wanted. So <laughs> I felt zero pressure personally. But then I didn't, I didn't write Laser Fortress. I just did it. I think that Gary had... Uh, I don't think we had an ex like I don't think we were trying to cater to our audience because you know we didn't have an audience at the beginning of the band and we didn't have an audience when we wrote Laser. I think we were we were putting a lot of pressure on ourselves to write something that like we were like it's got to be bigger than Laser. It's got to be more epic, you know. It's got to have more tracks. Laser had ten tracks. This one had thirteen tracks. Echoes had fourteen tracks. Like we were always trying to one up ourselves. We were always trying to be bigger, or do more than we did previously um i don't think it came from like the music scene or the you know the promoters or anything like that i think i think we had a pretty high expectation of ourselves but i also i also don't remember any of this being something that we had to like really work super super hard to to generate because between the five of us we had such different ideas that um it always kind of came sort of naturally the the outdoing the last album i guess you know what i mean just, there was always stuff to work with especially with, with gary's brain i mean let's be honest i mean obviously you drove the band mike but like gary had some crazy stuff coming out of there and adam you had a lot of technical stuff going on you know so i don't know i don't think it was ever a lot of pressure or stress although i never really felt the whole pressure or stress thing anyway so <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't either. It was just a curiosity because it was different. You know, Laser, we didn't have a care in the world. And all of a sudden, Harold, people were like, hey, we can't wait to listen to your album. We were like, oh, already? <laughs> See, I, remember, I remember us being extremely excited. Like, we were really happy with the songs that we had written. And we were always saying to ourselves, you know, if you really like Laser, wait till you hear this album. It's going to be, it's going to blow your socks off. It's, it's what we... Like it's what we wanted to do in Laser, but we were still figuring ourselves out. We didn't have a you know recording engineer behind us that knew what he was doing. Like we, I think we were really excited about it, and it was it was definitely a, a passion project. Um, 
So I think we were, if we were excited. Like anytime we got like a new mix and it had a new song and it, they're like the vocals were added to, we were like, that sounds epic. Like we were so like we were we were our own critics that we had to appease. We actually had um we took advantage of the fact that uh, CT and so Ed was in there because our, our we had a music video for Vera that had just nothing but shots of us, us recording Vera, us recording Vera, and well, and other things too. Like they took like all the footage and kind of I watch it all the time. Yeah. yeah, I watched that. I watched that recently. It's yeah. so cute. At, like we were all just so happy and like oh, it's just so cute because I think we really did like for that week because all of like the nitty gritty stuff was done. All of yeah. the fighting about the story was done. All of the fighting about who's gonna do this chord on this instrument that was all done. There was nothing to fight about. It was just like now we just get to do it and we get to do it with like all this cool equipment so it was like we really did just get to like hang out yeah and do what we loved and like I, it just was so nice that was one of my fondest memories is recording that album yeah i i do generally remember that as a joyous moment and i do watch that video occasionally because it was a simpler time. We were talking about laser and the earth grid cover art. This one is just a simple little tiny EKG blip. Because somebody dies. Well, I think we were trying to be um, <laughs> subtle, I suppose. <laughs> well, we were trying to, okay, so Laser Fortress was big epic battles in space, blah, 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 blah. blah. You know, the, when we wanted to do Death of the Herald, it was an origin story. It was like, how did this all start? And like, the, if you boil it down to like, what causes everything, like the entire trilogy? What does it stem from? It stems from a person who discovers that there's a way to extend your life infinitely. We went with the blip, which, I mean, yes, it could be death, but it also could be life. It could be, so the little DNA helix could be, it could be ironic because even though the story is about people and people wanting to live and the human condition, you know. Also, again, I want to, I want to reiterate that, that, for, for, for every single album we've ever released, EP, regular album, whatever, minus a simpler time, I've done the, uh, the art album artwork and I'm, I'm not a designer, I'm terrible, so like it's literally what can I find that's free that I can put together and make it look good. So that was really easy. And it kind of fit with the theme of the, the album, so boom, done. It was also one of the best um, drum heads. Oh, drum head looked sick, yeah really was yeah oh yeah i forgot about that i mean the moon the moon was cool for laser fortress and yeah. the oh no that was the earth so we always say that because it was like crescent shape or so was moon. the earth was cool for laser fortress and the exploding moon was cool for echoes but i don't know just the blip man it was just simple cool it popped 4g what was your favorite song on this album to play live play live i think it's induction i it's such a it's it's very proggy ish in a sense that you don't have your traditional verse chorus verse chorus. It goes off, it sandwiches, it modulates within. It starts off really slow, gets more and more intense. It's very story driven. The whole, it's mostly instrumental, but like it's it's all about I don't know. It's a lot of action, and it's fun to play that that guitar part for me. Um, and that when the whole band kicks in, it's to me it always felt really really like powerful. I love it. So great. Done. Angela, how about you? What is your favorite song when you were doing this? What did you love to play live? It's hard. I like singing more than anything. So, like, I really liked A New Beginning because I, I liked, I don't know, there's something about A New Beginning that I just really like. It's a good song. And there's, I don't know, oh man, I don't know. I like a lot of, I like them all. <laughs> I don't like this question. This isn't as easy as laser for me where I was like, clone, it's clone or nothing. Like I I just uh there's so there's so many fun parts to play on the keyboard because I finally had a say in, in the keyboard where if I didn't want to do it, I would say no. So <laughs> I generally enjoyed playing everything because if I didn't then I just wouldn't do it because I was a brat. 
<laughs> there, was, there's no, there was no parts I can remember that you were like, the band was fighting you on playing or not playing, though. Oh, sometimes. Like, I remember when we play, when we would play Vera, there was, uh, when, when I would sing the, uh, the chorus, I think, I wouldn't play the keyboard at all. And I remember, I remember you were always like, Angela, there's keyboard parts, so you play them on the album. And I would just be like, uh huh. Yep. Yeah. And I just would never play <laughs> I don't know why. You were focused. I don't know. Yeah, I just. I, I, yeah, I was. I was busy. Essentially, I was busy. I was busy. But I, I don't know. I don't know. I like everything. Although I think the the most interesting song to play live was a dark thought. Interesting. I, just, I, I find that song to be just so strange and so cool, and I really like it. Nicole, I. Uh, if you, what do you like most off this album, or what would you bring, what would you want to bring back? I always liked singing Essential Arms. Um, I love Vera. It's definitely, has given me a, a challenge at first. I think I have it down now, but I overthought it for a while. Um, but I like that the band seems to have a lot of fun playing Vera, and that in the end, everybody, everybody starts singing. Like, I love that build-up part, the one-by-one. Um, so those songs we still play. Um, I think I have always liked Phantoms and Abduction, and we've, we haven't played them, I don't think, since I've been in the band. We have a whole list of stuff we're going to have to bring back. As soon as we're let, like, go out and rehearse again, we have so much to do. Nick, how about you? Uh, what, what would you feel that you would be interested in bringing back or what do you really like that we, we currently do? I'd like to do uh, United Earth Lens Assembly, but <laughs> I'm probably alone in that one. Uh, <laughs> honestly, I really like playing Central Arms. Um, it's probably my favorite to play off the record. Uh, I think, honestly, it doesn't, uh, don't mean to think if it ain't got that swing, right? Well, you put the little purdy shuffle in it and that's... that's no, it, was, it was already sworn. It was already sworn, man. Tim did such a great job with that drum part. Tim did do a good job with that drum part. Oh, oh, oh stop, 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 stop. <laughs> no, I will not, good sir. <laughs> <laughs> John, so you haven't had the luxury of, of playing any of these with us yet, but what song, this would have been the heyday when we probably played the most amount of shows together between 74 and, and any band you had been in at the time. What song drew you to this album? Or what song even drew you for, to the band? I mean, you're in the band now. What? Well, uh, yeah, I mean... I mentioned last last week that uh, it was mostly the songs of Laser Fortress when I when I first started hanging out with you guys. But I I still remember the first show I did with you guys when you finished this album and, and you personally handed me a, a a CD of the album with the you know I remember seeing the uh, EKG meter and everything. I was I was super psyched to listen to that in the car. I would say Great Galactic War is just an amazing song. But having gone through these recently and I'm you know on my own I'm woodshedding these songs and and learning them all. Uh, <clears throat> Ultimatum just grooves so hard. I, I I love that groove. It's such like a simple but like awesome groove. Cool. You can say you can sing that with me, Ben. How I could sing and play that at the same time? I don't, I don't know. You can so, do like, it. I, you can try. do it. <laughs> I believe you. The only time I ever watched Gary struggle like to to sing and play because Gary could pretty much just do anything anyone threw at him, and then he would he would do it and then make it way more complicated and do it even better. The only time I ever watched him struggle was learning. It took him a while to get real comfortable singing and playing Ultimatum, and he he really had trouble because it was pretty much the tippy tippy top of his range, singing and playing his part at the beginning of Death of the Herald. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's like a competing rhythm between the vocals and the bass there. Yeah. That's so it's yeah. it's that's tough. That was tough. But some of the higher parts in Ultimatum, you guys handed to me and Maria, like the end of, I don't know, like the pre-chorus or something, maybe. Can't remember the part. But it's the higher part in Gary's range you are now our part. So it's even easier, John. Got it. Yeah. Or John's 597th thing you need to learn. <laughs> well, now that the lineup is a little bit different, you know, we have to go back to anything we want to play. We have to think about okay, now we have another vo a new vocalist. Like we've done this every time. So every single member, with the exception of John, because you're you're new ish, but even Nick and Nicole, you, you've been here for this. Like our members change. 
how are we going to perform these songs? And we need to make sure it sounds good. So we go back to the whole, all right, you try singing this, then you sing this. All right, nope, change the harmony. You're going to do this. Blah, blah, blah. You know, we, we try to make whatever, we try to make it sound good based on who's there. So there's no ego right. bruised or anything like that. And, it, and it's like, I have the highest voice, but sometimes Mike singing the higher part sounds better just because of the way it sounds. And so we go back and forth. You try this part. No, now let's switch. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's been a part, I mean, that's been a part of the bands for, since Laser, pretty much, like, being able to do that. Tim, you haven't told us. What's your favorite song on the album? Uh, I think you said to play live, right? Yeah, well, what's your favorite? Ba, 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 and anything else, I, just, I like to sing and whatnot. But drum wise, that was that was the tits, man. <laughs> I do enjoy that song too. I just want to end, and and maybe this isn't the best thing to end on, but it's certainly something we should discuss. Angela, you you decided to leave us at the end of shortly thereafter, at the end of this album, maybe about a year later. Um, yeah. I think it was like a year after. Yeah, you know, just about. I mean, you played a lot with us, and there's there's a phenomenal video that. Uh, Chip just put out of us doing the Daffodil Festival the year that the album came out. So there's some really good stuff happening and some good nostalgia going on. But we were so sad to see you go. What what you departed and and Parker who came in to to take off uh, on keyboards and vocals. Um, and hopefully we'll get to talk to her next week because she was part of the Echoes of War uh, recording. We were we were so sad when you left. What what um, where did you go? Where, <laughs> where did you go? Florida. We know you went to Florida. We know you went to Florida, but. That, yeah, eventually. That was recent, though. That was, like, a year ago. Um, well, I think I was I was just, like, super... Uh, I was, like, super different in my mindset than everyone else, I feel like. Like, I wanted to... Just what I said, I wanted to wear pretty dresses and sing. I wanted, like, like this, like, hyper-theatrical, like, very musical theater style, like, intense in your face like gothic revival looking insanity and um i don't know i think like i just i just like had this vision of what i wanted and i think i got bogged down like there were times where it was great and we'd play a zen bar show and it would be like the best night of my life and then the, the night later we would play at this bar for the bartender and it was like I, I like literally spent three hours doing my hair to play for a bartender who couldn't make a rum and coke. So like, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> no. I just got like so worn down. I was also dealing with a lot. Like I, I had a lot of uh, like emotional instability and uh, it got better. <laughs> it got better. <laughs> But, I, thought gonna, I thought you were going to say going to La Grande Fromage is when you were like, nope, I'm done with this band. Uh, that was close. Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I was just, it, it's like, I, I, I was just tired of playing for nobody. And again, like I said, when it was good, it was so good. But when it wasn't, holy shit, was it trash. I remember playing in Jersey. That was the worst time of my life. I remember like crying in the car on the way home, whining the entire way there. I'm sure it wasn't fun for anybody, but like <laughs> it, it was just really hard on me. I, I, really hard on me. It was almost like every time we played was like an audition for a part and we only made it one out of like I would say ten times and we just kept trying kept trying kept trying kept trying and like we were always playing we would play Thursday through Sunday and and we would have four nights in a row where we would play for nobody we knew and nobody we didn't know and it was just exhausting for me and uh and then at that point it was just like my life was chaos not not just the band stuff but like my life was chaos and i think just like those things crashing together 
I didn't even, I just like stopped coming to rehearsals, I think. I don't even think I said anything. I think I just stopped coming and then eventually I sent out like a mass text that was just like, hey guys, I don't think I can do this anymore. And it was after like a long time of me not coming to practice because I didn't want to give up the band. I loved you all. Like I, I still do. Like you're, you were my best friends for like, what, four or five years? You were like, yeah, you were my best friends. So I didn't want to say goodbye to the band. But then I also realized like I couldn't keep doing it and I couldn't, I couldn't like keep carrying on without saying anything. So that's when I decided to leave. Well, there are no goodbyes. Once, once a member of 74, always a member of 74. I do remember the last game we played with you was with Joey Bats and them at the Manchester place. What was that? Uh, oh, Main Pub. Oh, Main Pub. Sorry, Main Pub. Main Pub. It was yeah. Halloween. That was our, yeah, that was our, I think that was our last show together. What, when, what, what year was that? 2014? You were there. That would have been with me. Yeah, you were playing with Joey. Oh, no, you were there. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have my strongest memories of you from when you were in Joey Bats and them. I don't oh, think sorry. after Joey Bats and them disbanded, I. I haven't done it. I haven't, like, I associate not with Joey Bats, like, musically at all after that point. Well, the like, only two, like, I always associate we, we kind of, did shows together, though. We did High Adventure shows together. We did Whatsoever show, that one Whatsoever. whatsoever. I do, yeah. I, no, I, I remember the Whatsoever, I do remember that, but, like, yeah. Joey Bats and them was, um, I remember just, like, I don't know what it was. Maybe it's just that we did more shows with you guys. We did the Glass we did, we did few, yeah. the main pub, um, were you guys at the uh, the New England Music Awards that year? The Joey Betts? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Open up. yeah. Right. So I just have a stronger memory of you in that group because I think we were with you. We associate with hip hop. I get it. It's funny. It makes sense. I just keep <laughs> fucking rocking on the bass. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's all I have, guys. Is there anything anybody wants to say about the death of the Herald uh, or, or this particular time in our gigging career best 1974 album man's down it's in the top three for sure <laughs> so good at least i had the most fun recording this album out of any other album it's not my favorite one to listen to but it, it was my favorite experience recording it and writing an album i think oh that's so sweet i yeah, had awesome i had a lot of fun on this one too i really did i love that gary sang so much i i remember specifically pushing for more gary all the time to sing because i love gary's voice and I do, I remember like sitting on the couch, um, like in the little, like the recording room and, and, uh, I would like sit on the couch with Gary and I would just, I would like pep talk the shit out of him. I would just be like, your voice sounds so fucking cool on this part. And when you do this one thing like this, it sounds so good. And I would just like, just amp him up as much as I could. Cause I love Gary's voice and I love hearing him sing. And it was like, so fun to hear so much, Gary. I loved that. I want to thank everybody. Uh, Mike for Jets, Nick and Nicole Dickinson, Angela Doherty, John Dotson, Tim Moore. Tim, it is so great to see you again, buddy, man. I, 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 yeah, hope, yeah. I hope you're here again next week when we do Echoes. And Angela, oh, yeah, man. Angela, you and Tim, when we do our reunion show in 30 years, you're coming back, you're doing it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Happening. Sure. As long as I can wear a pretty dress. Thank you guys so much, and uh, we'll hopefully see everybody again next week, and we'll talk a little bit about how we transitioned out of this into uh, the Echoes of War. Bye. Bye.